What up, Skizzle? I'm Leon, the Paperback Maniac, coming at you with another vintage horror book review. Today, we are taking a look at Demonic Color by Pauline Dunn. Now, Pauline Dunn was the pen name of two sisters, uh, Don Pauline Dunn and Susan Hartzell who gained some infamy with the release of their third and final novel, 1991's The Crawling Dark, when it transpired that they had actually plagiarized quite a bit from the 1983 Dean Koontz novel, Phantoms. Um, now, I have not read Phantoms, unfortunately, so I can't comment on the similarities, but apparently this book also uh, borrowed, let's say, elements from phantoms and was pulled from publication when this whole thing uh, transpired um, and the Dunn sisters have not published any other books under uh, the Pauline Dunn uh, pen name since then. I will get a little more into that controversy I guess at the end of this review. Uh, for now I will read the synopsis from the back cover here. It was no plague or chemical but something much more evil. Though his parents forbade him, Jimmy Arnold couldn't resist detouring through the junkyard on his way home from school. He'd done it a zillion times and knew it was absolutely safe. Besides, by polishing up some of the cool thingamabobs he found and selling them, he could raise enough money for that bike his dad wouldn't buy him. But when Jimmy reached for a particularly attractive find, he noticed an overpowering smell, and then a weird vapor, and then he felt... The good people of town Indiana were mortified at the news of Jimmy Arnold's death. They couldn't imagine how the boy's body had gotten so hideously disfigured and completely devoid of blood or organs. But the Midwestern community would know soon enough exactly what sort of beast had ravaged Jimmy Arnold. It was a scenario that would play itself out again and again, death after death. Something was feeding off town, draining life, growing stronger with each kill. And it seemed impossible to stop. So the 1970s and 1980s gave us a wealth of wonderful paperback originals. We got books featuring killer rats, killer cats, killer jellyfish, killer spiders, killer worms, killer fungus. So it seems inevitable that in 1990, we would finally get a killer cloud. It's just, just amazing. Um, so this book opens, as the scenario tells us, with 10-year-old Jimmy Arnold, who is scavenging at the town dump, uh, looking to spear some rats with his new jackknife, because apparently that's what 10-year-old uh, kids like to do in these small you know, Midwestern towns. When then he is assailed by a dense, swirling, malefic fog that quickly penetrates his pores and causes excruciating agony, which is rendered by the Dunn sisters in loving Sean Hudson-esque detail. Now, there are two camps of horror writers. There are those uh, minimalists who think less is more, and then, then there are writers like the Dunn sisters and the aforementioned Sean Hudson, who are not content with just giving us uh, a few sentences or even a single paragraph of, of detail when it comes to deaths, but go on and on in, in loving delineation of uh, their characters' demises. I am going to read you guys, uh, the description of little 10-year-old Jimmy Arnold's death here. His organs were collapsing. He was being consumed, digested from within. His body protested violently in a futile attempt to combat the nameless intrusion. The sound of his scream was cut off as masses of digested fluids erupted out of his mouth. He doubled over and fell to the ground. He couldn't breathe. He tore at his face, clawing at his nose and lips to let in more air. The corrosive liquids filled his lungs and burned his eyes, continuing to eat away at the tender inner core of his being. His senses exploded in sheer torment. His mind no longer functioned except to register new sources of pain. He thrashed and groped in the dirt, his fingers digging into the hard, unyielding earth. 
A heavy blackness crept in, into the corners of his fevered mind, growing larger and darker. As he was slowly absorbed, it fed not only on his body, but upon his very soul, threatening to swallow him entirely. And through his mind's eye, he saw the horrors that were to come. Slowly, his skin began to shrivel, to turn gray and brittle, tightening as the monstrous mist sucked the life from him. His taut, dry flesh cracked and split. The thick, viscous bile that his vital organs had become oozed forth. <laughs> so, yeah, later, uh, his body is found at the town dump, and it's just a uh, quote-unquote rotted, grotesque lump of pulp and bone. He was a dried, blackened mass that had to be literally shoveled into a bag. So... Uh, yeah, pretty, uh, pretty gnarly, right? Uh, then we uh, shift scene to the uh, town boarding house. And by the way, the town is literally called town. Uh, and we meet uh, the, the um, owner of the boarding house, uh, an elderly uh, woman named Abigail Morton, who is waiting for her friend to pick her up to take her to the funeral of little Jimmy Arnold. When she smells this awful stench coming from uh, the upstairs, uh, one of the upstairs rooms in her boarding house. Uh, it's actually coming from the room of a young couple uh, that has a, a baby. And she's kind of, uh, you know, concerned about this. So she goes upstairs, uh, tries to figure out what's going on. And uh, she finally makes her way uh, inside the room and finds on the floor the contorted form of the baby, uh, which is lying in a puddle of goo. And um, I, I'm sorry, I have to read to you guys uh, the quote of this baby. Um, on the floor... Near the rug, the gnarled form of the baby lay sprawled in a darkening puddle of glutinous fluid. Small, glassy eyes stared sightlessly up at her. Its tiny body was hideously discolored, dry and crumbling, the skin recessed and pulled tightly over the bones. It was split in numerous places, huge jagged, tear, jagged tears dissecting the misshapen miniature arms and legs, trailing all the way into the fine feathering of down-like hair. The large, open lesions revealed a mass of yellowish slime that continued to vomit out of the wounds like lava as the baby's ashen flesh caved in further. And uh, the baby's mother isn't doing that much better. Uh, she's found half out of the window, uh, convulsing as her sort of body starts to collapse inward and just uh, shrivel up and erupt into these terrible open sores and lesions. So... Um, the town doctor gets called. Uh, this general practitioner arrives at the scene and starts sort of, uh, you know, investigating these bodies. He finds that um, both of the bodies, as well as little Jimmy Arnold, actually, uh, are secreting this uh, highly lethal, uh, these digestive juices that uh, will sort of uh, burn your skin like acid if it comes into contact uh, with them. And... Um, and, uh, and, and these sort of attacks uh, go on uh, in the town. A, a couple more uh, kids get attacked and um, another tenant at the boarding house. And then we meet our hero of the novel, uh, another tenant in the boarding house, Stephen Meyer, who uh, had grown up in this town, town uh, and then moved away to Chicago but has recently moved back to his to his hometown after the death of his wife, uh, who was murdered in Chicago, and and he's he's an artist, and um, and he kind of teams up with the town sheriff and the mayor and the uh, the doctor, and they try to get to the bottom of this. They want to find out, uh, you know, what is causing these horrific deaths. Could it be uh, like a chemical spill? Is this germ warfare? Could a person be involved? Because uh, oddly, each of the victims. Uh, seem like they had put up a struggle against a person, uh, even though, you know, they're found uh, just completely eaten away from the insides with no uh, blood or organs uh, left in their bodies. So could, could a person be behind this? Uh, these are the questions that plague Stephen and the people of, of town. So, um, yeah, you know, 
There really isn't a whole lot to say about this book. I, I mean, I think the reason I'm reading to you guys these passages is because that is really what this book has to offer. Uh, this book is is for gore hounds. Uh, I mean, if you like, you know, that kind of early Peter Jackson levels of gore, I mean, think, you know, movies like Bad Taste or Brain Dead, then you know, then you might get some enjoyment out of, out of this book. Now, I had read uh, Pauline Dunn's first uh, published novel, also published by Zebra, called Flesh Stealer. And I thought when I read that, that that was one of the goriest and most mean-spirited books I had ever read. And this one uh, just might beat that one out. It's close. I don't know. That one may be a little more mean-spirited, but this is just... just uh, I, I was in awe reading this book. I mean, reading some of these passages, um, I don't know if I wrote any any more of them down, but just the way that the authors <laughs> describe like just these bodies being found and how they're just spewing forth like this, um, you know, like gruesome, uh, what is it? I, I wrote a quote, a, a gruesome abundance of mucus spewing forth from the open sores. I mean, this this is just gnarly stuff. Um, of course, you know, characterization is about as deep as a shallow grave. You're not going to get much characterization here. Um, you know, there are a couple of subplots that were were interesting. Uh, there's a subplot concerning uh, the town mayor, who is just an awful person. This novel, uh, these these writers really like to write about just like terrible people. Maybe just to make it a little more easy to take their the grisly demises. But uh, the mayor in this book is just an awful, awful human who's who uses his wife. Uh, just for sex and is cheating on his wife and um and then the wife kind of knows this and she you know decides that eventually she's had enough and she's going to get some revenge that was kind of an interesting and satisfying subplot there's also a, another subplot concerning the uh chef uh deputy sheriff who is a, a vicious and just a real asshole who is um bit seeing the town uh this this hooker who's also a junkie of course, cheating on his wife, and he's been seeing this uh, this woman who's a waitress, but also a junkie, and, and I think a hooker. And um, you know, he's very abusive toward her, and uh, it's just it's pretty hard to take. But you know, those those subplots were actually I thought a little more interesting than the than the main storyline of this uh, of this sort of noxious evil mist that's going around and killing people. Um, but really. The reason to read this book is, you know, for those passages. If you're uh, if you're someone who likes to read just very very finely detailed graphic depictions of of death and mutilation, uh, then you know, if you're a splatter person, um, this is is the book for you. Um, I don't know. I wrote some notes here, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. There, there's really not a whole lot to say about this book. I mean, so, you know, we get just constant depictions of splitting and oozing bodies. We get these swirling sort of like, you know, iridescent, noxious clouds that uh, eat people up from the insides. You know, we get a, a man mutated into mist at the end, which is kind of cool. Um, there's a scene at the end where our group of heroes that are equipped with um, these sort of packs uh, on their back and they're they're spewing um, acetylene uh, solution out of these nozzles at the mist. It felt like a cut-rate trash horror version of Slimer and the Real Ghostbusters. Uh, that was kind of amusing. But um, yeah, you know, like if you like violence and gore, this is for you. Now... Um, I would really be interested to read Phantoms uh, by Dean Koontz. And I, I think it might be interesting at one point on this channel to read that one and then The Crawling Dark in tandem. And so you can, so I can really kind of like compare the two because The Crawling Dark, their third book, is the one that really apparently has, um, you know, lifted a lot from that book. But I, I guess this one did too. I just... I, I have a hard time believing that. I mean, I don't see any of Dean Koontz here. I mean, Dean Koontz is a guy who bristles when people call him a horror writer. And, you know, 
claims that he's just like a supernatural, uh, you know, like mystery, like thriller writer. I mean, this, it doesn't get much more horror than this. I mean, much more in the sense of like, you know, just trashy, lowbrow horror. Um, I mean, I don't know what they could have taken from, from Dean Koontz, but it would be really, you know, interesting to, to, to kind of read and compare. But, you know, in terms of the controversy, you know, I, I of course, I, 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 Felt, you know, there was a New York Times article written about the two writers, which, you know, you can easily find if you just, you know, Google uh, Pauline Dunn and plagiarism and Dean Koontz. It's, it's still available online. This was a huge expose and it became this big thing, you know, in the early 90s when it was revealed. And apparently it caused a rift between the two sisters as well. Who knows what was going on, you know, what the background there was. But I have to say, you know, I do not condone plagiarism at all. However, I think that there is a bit of a double standard when it comes to these things because, of course, when it's a horror writer, this is a huge big deal. And I'm sure the New York Times was slather, slavering and just frothing at the mouth, uh, you know, loving it to, to just make this, you know, publish this and make it a big deal. But when the same thing happens with like a respectable, reputable literary writer, uh, a writer like, for example, Ian McEwen, uh, who is, you know, an adored writer, and for good reason, he's a great writer, but but a man who has been accused on multiple occasions of plagiarism, and, and who, you know, at one point, I mean, had pretty much lifted almost word for word in his Booker Prize winning novel, The Atonement, which, of course, he claimed, and which a bunch of uh, other literary writers backed him up and said, oh, no, that was just research. But it was clearly, uh, you know, if you look at the two, you know, like his words and the passages from what he took from, I mean, it looked, it looked pretty much like plagiarism to me. I mean, probably not that much farther off from what I imagine the Dunn sisters might have done with Dean Koontz in this book, at least. But, you know, I do feel that there is a bit of a double standard there. If it's a literary writer, oh, it's okay, you know, we'll forgive you. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's just research, they're doing it. But if it's a horror writer, it's like, oh, you plagiarist, you know, fuck off. You know, we're never going to let you publish another thing again. Get out of here. Um, so in that sense, you know, I do feel bad. Now, then again, as I said, I have not read um, Phantoms, the Dean Koontz novel, and I have not read the third one, which I, I apparently is, is much, much closer uh, and, and similar in, in the things that it took from, from Dean Koontz. So, yeah, it will be interesting to, to at one point, you know, check those two out and, and do that comparison. I will definitely read The Crawling Dark. I mean, I've read the first two books, as I said, you know, very, very gory, very, very mean-spirited. But, I mean, if you just want to read something that's going to make your jaw drop, <laughs> this, this is it. So, um, yeah, that is, uh, Demonic Color by Pauline Dunn. Um, hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, before I go, I just want to give a, a sincere thank you to Cameron Chaney, who is such an awesome dude. Uh, he recently did a video where he uh, shouted out uh, some horror booktubers, and he mentioned me on there and said some really kind things about uh, the channel. And it really made, gave me a huge spike in uh, subscribers. I mean, I was at work on Friday and I keep I kept getting these email notifications saying like, oh, you have a new subscriber, you have a new subscriber. And I had like, like 25 or 30 new subscribers like within an hour. And I was like, what the hell is this? Like, am I getting spam like subscribers? And then I came home and I saw this video that Cameron had done and uh, – it's just, just so cool. I mean, it, it's a great video, uh, by the way, and it actually alerted me to some some uh, booktubers I wasn't familiar with. So, so thank you so much, Cameron, for doing that. Um, it, it did really help. It will be. I will be curious to see how many of those uh, new, I'm sure, casual booktube subscribers uh, uh, quickly unsubscribe from my channel after they find out what this channel is all about. Perhaps after they watch this video and see the kind of crap that I talk about. But um, you know, that's okay. That happens all the time. Uh, you know, my core will remain, and that's what's important. But uh, yeah. Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, check back in about, I don't know, a week or so. I should be having another book haul video. Got some gems, as always, uh, to show you. But until then, take it easy. I'll see you later. Peace out.